Okay, praise the Lord. Wonderful to be in his house together this morning, so to speak. Um, and we are going to be in John chapter 18 uh, together. So if you have a Bible, you'd like to join us, John chapter 18. And let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your words of encouragement as we consider your spirit in us, enabling us to have a witness, a testimony to shine brightly uh, with your light in this world. And God, we trust you now for these words to follow. Please bring us into um, just a, a sense of your presence, teaching us, leading us, opening your word to us now during this time. And in Jesus' name, continue to minister to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have had a wonderful journey uh, in, in John's gospel. Um, and it, and I, I realized, as I was doing, I was realizing how much I love the book of John. I, I said to my wife, I said, oh, if there was only one book in the Bible I could keep, I think it would be the book of John. But then I realized as I was studying for Daniel, I realized, oh, how much I love the book of Daniel. And, and I, I think when that people would ask you that question, what's your favorite book of the Bible? I think for me, it's whatever book I'm studying <laughs> at that time because every book of the Bible is such a treasure it is so rich uh, but we certainly enjoyed our time in the book of John and this gospel is incredible we studied chapters 13 14 15 16 which is called the upper room discourse the time where Jesus had that last intimate uh, session uh, with his friends with his disciples uh, on that Thursday night of the Passion Week and he concludes it, chapter 17, with that high priestly prayer when uh, God the Son looks to God the Father and there's that beautiful prayer of intercession for he is praying not only for his disciples, the 11 at that time, but also looks ahead and prays for the church as a model or a taster of that intercessory priesthood that he entered into after the ascension. So when he concludes that prayer, he finishes that prayer and then he comes to chapter 18 which leads us to Gethsemane and of course this is such a special uh, uh, focused time in this garden with his disciples and it's interrupted by uh, Judas and those who come into the garden to arrest the Lord and chapter 18 on of course now frames the the trials the crucifixion the resurrection uh, that follows so um, Gethsemane, the, the word Gethsemane, it means um, the uh, oil press or the place of crushing. And if you visit Israel today, as we have done many times as tour guides and, and uh, tour passers rather, I remember our tour guide on one trip, uh, he was sharing this with us. We were in Gethsemane and of course it's bustling with tourists, but nevertheless you can sense the tranquility as, as this, this small portion of what would have been a larger garden is enclosed. And I remember him sharing with us that principle about the place of crushing. And he spoke about how the Lord uh, was there in, in prayer and, and the sweating drops of blood and asking the Father for the cup to pass. I remember our tour guide breaking and his eyes welling up with tears. I remember the special time we had considering uh, that this is the place Gethsemane um, and uh, and we'll join it in verse 1 it says when Jesus had spoken these words and again this refers back to that upper room discourse and the prayer that he'd had with them so after that special time of being with them we remember that night when he washed the disciples feet how he taught them many principles uh, his promises of joy and love and peace particularly the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, he predicts that he would be betrayed he gives them the great commandment to love so after this special time he takes his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered so the lay of the land um, he would be looking across the Kidron little brook or little valley across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. And it's a small 
mount that if, if you, you could look and you would see the eastern wall or the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus was there many times on the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of that mountain was a place that he would go frequently on his own to pray to the Father and to be with his disciples, to fellowship, to pray, to teach them. And he would look across that Kidron Valley uh, to the temple and to Jerusalem. And we should not miss the relevance of this because this was the place where Judas, one of the twelve, one of his friends, one who had been with him for those three years, uh, this was the place that Judas would betray him. A very special place, a special place for our Lord on the earth that he would go to often. Uh, at the end of John 7, verse 53, everyone went to his own house, and then the next verse, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Luke 21, 37, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. And 22:39, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed to do, and his disciples also followed him. And that's this time here. He leads them across the little Kidron Valley up onto the mount to the Garden of Gethsemane. So think for a moment of what a special place this would have been also for the disciples. The times that they had with him, asking him questions, fellowshipping with him, uh, sleeping there through the night uh, after, after hearing Christ teach through the day. It was a beautiful place, a tranquil place, a place where they would have so many memories of joy and things that they were learning, special times with the Lord, praying together, being broken together, laughing together. And, uh, and this was the place uh, where Jesus would be betrayed. So when you frame it that way, you realize how shocking it is that this would be the place that Judas would betray the Lord. And Jesus knew when he took the disciples there, he knew that shortly following Judas was going to betray him. This is verse 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So it would have been a, a treacherous, despicable thing to betray the Lord anywhere, but how much more to choose this to be the place to betray the Lord. It shows how hard his heart had become, how shameless he was in doing this. It would be like a husband cheating on his wife, and the place that he chose to do so would be somewhere that was so intimate for him and his wife, uh, perhaps the place they went on their honeymoon or something like that. How, how, what a deeper blow that would strike in the heart of the wife to find out that that was the place he chose. How heartless. And that's what's happening here. Judas choosing this place of all places, the Garden of Gethsemane, to be the place to betray the Lord. And not only that, but he chooses the sign to indicate his betrayal to be a kiss. Something so intimate, obviously something that wasn't so unusual, that he, there will be the kiss of a friend expressing such love and friendship. Now, let's just go back a few hours earlier on that Thursday night when they're in the upper room, when Judas was still there before he slipped out into the night. We go back to John 13. When Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And Jesus, knowing the Father, had given all things to his hands, and he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper, lays aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself, poured the water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And Judas was one of those disciples. Think of that moment. Think of Jesus knowing all that was before him, knowing full well what it meant for them to cross the Kidron Valley, to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that would be the place he would be betrayed, and then go to his mock trials and to the cross. Jesus, knowing this, 
before Judas, perhaps glancing up into his eyes and seeing his friend washing his feet with the deepest expression of servanthood, a love that would serve, and he washed the feet of Judas. Again, shocking that Jesus, as the master, their rabbi, would wash the feet of any of the disciples, but how much more that he would wash the feet of his betrayer continues in 13 18 jesus says after that he says he says um i don't speak concerning all of you i know whom i have chosen but that the scripture may be fulfilled he who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me and here jesus is predicting his betrayal he looks back to a verse in psalm 55 where it says it is not an enemy who reproaches me then I could bear it nor is it one who hates me who has lifted up his heel against me then I could hide from him but it was you a man my equal my companion my acquaintance we took sweet counsel together and we walked to the house of God together in the crowd this was his friend one who had been with him closely for those three years he continues in verse 21 jesus says after that he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said most assuredly i say to you one of you will betray me and then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke notice that they began to look at one another they were troubled about who it was that he was talking about it always strikes me that none of them said judas he wasn't the obvious choice. They all began to ask, is it I, Lord, or who is it, Lord? It wasn't obvious that it was Judas. When we see the, the, the movies, Judas always is portrayed as the one who is dark, stroking his beard with a sinister look, perhaps a dark robe. It wouldn't, wasn't like that. He would have been perhaps the last one to be chosen. Or maybe Peter, or maybe Philip, but Judas, no. The trusted treasurer of the group. They were troubled about whom he spoke and leaning on Jesus' bosom was one of the disciples whom Jesus loved, John. And Simon Peter asked him to ask the Lord, who, who is it? Lord, who is it? What's also sobering about that is to think that none of the disciples after those years would have any suspicions. How, how well he had pretended and there was a hardening of the heart through those years. Judas has heard all the same sermons, seen all the same miracles, been there all those times at Gethsemane and up in Galilee, but it was not enough. It's a sobering warning for us that it's not enough to be where Jesus is. I could be reading my Bible in, in church for many years, and yet still not be a true follower of the Lord in my heart and know I would know that as Judas did but it served his purpose for that time Jesus continues in verse 26 he says it is he to whom I will give a piece of bread when I have dipped it and having dipped the bread he gave it to Judas Iscariot he seems the only only John heard that and after the piece of bread was given Satan entered him and Jesus said to him what you do do quickly but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him and having received the piece of bread he went out immediately and it was night and how dark that night was particularly in the heart of Judas so now we fast forward again a few of a few hours and now Jesus has led across to the garden of Gethsemane He's there in the moonlit night, for Passover was typically on a full moon, and the moonlit night in the garden, it was quiet. He's with his disciples. Perhaps they're preparing to spend the night there, and then all of a sudden, they hear a bit of commotion. They see through the olive trees, there's, there's lanterns and voices, a commotion, and Judas arrives, verse 3, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, he, they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And this word, detachment of troops or a band of, 
of men, as, as certain translations King James says, is a mass of men or a troop. It, it speaks of Roman soldiers and also uh, the offices of the Jewish temple, plural were there. This word typically, a troop of soldiers, could refer to a hundred or two hundred or more men. So maybe in our mind's eye you have the idea of a small handful of men. No, this was a, a mass of men, a huge group that had come, armed with weapons and staves and spears and, and swords and torches to arrest the Lord. Matthew 26, 7, a great multitude, it says, with swords and staves. And notice the end of verse 5 here in John 18. And Judas also, which betrayed him, and this is the the title that he earned himself, it always would say by the other writers, Judas, the one who betrayed the Lord, or Judas, the traitor. It says, he stood with them. This is another phrase deserving of some pause. Again, to think, here, what happened over those years? Judas, who was with the Lord all those time, all that time, and now he stood with them, ready to sell the Lord betray the Lord. The kiss is not mentioned here in the Gospel of John, but Luke 22, verse 48, Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? In full awareness. Matthew 26, 48, now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? And then they lay their hands on Jesus. Oh, my acquaintance, my companion, my friend. Oh, we, we took sweet counsel together. We walked to the house of the Lord together. Are you betraying me with a kiss? Verse 4, back in John's Gospel, tells us, Jesus, therefore, here it is again, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? So John frames this, this account in a different way to the synoptics. John puts Jesus certainly as not the one, as the voluntary sacrifice, because he highlights the fact that Jesus is ready, he's predicted it, he's waiting, he, is, um, he, is, he, he goes forth to meet them and ask them, who are you seeking? It's amazing. Back in John 6, after feeding the 5,000, it says they're ready to make him a king by force, and Jesus slips away. But here they are ready to take him to the cross. And he steps forth and he says, are you looking for someone? For now his hour had come. Matthew 26, 45, when he says to, to his other disciples, are you sleeping? Are you resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, for my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas and a great multitude came upon them so again jesus is the willing sacrifice not fleeing not hiding not running but uh, he he says in this chapter shall i not drink the cup the father has given me he shows the resolve of jesus in the other synoptics we see his prayer where he says oh father if this cup could pass but nevertheless your will be done but not in john's gospel he says i will take the cup that my father has given me and they answer and say we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth and he says to them I am he in fact the word he is added in it's in italics by the translators he actually says I am now when he said this to them verse 6 I am they went backwards and fell to the ground now this needs our, pers our careful attention notice this he says, I am, 
And this mass of men, these soldiers armed with lanterns and all of the officers of the chief priests, this mass of men that are now gathering around, perhaps surrounding Jesus and his disciples. When Jesus says, I am, they go backwards and they fall to the ground. Some of the explanations of some of the commentators on this I, is laughable. I don't know why they would make such... It's clear what was happening here. Now, if we, if we look back, in, particularly in the Gospel of John, there are times when he uses this phrase, I am, and he's, it's clearly a claim uh, uh, to deity. We can see back in John 8... Verse 24, he says, you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am, and again they put he, but he's, he's saying um, ego aini, it's, my, it's I am. Verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. But the most clear case is, is, in, is at the end of the chapter. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. And they say, you are not old enough to have seen Abraham, verse 58. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and passed by. Why did they take up stones to stone him? Because they knew that he was making a claim not to just pre pre-existent, but to be the eternal God. But this looks back to Exodus chapter 3, when Moses said, Whom shall I say sent me? And he said, Say that I am sent you. The verb to be, the pre-existent eternal God. And Jesus said, I am. So he's clearly claiming to be God. And when he says this, and all the, the, the context is so beautiful, in the in the in the event where the seeming weakness of Jesus the victim being led away against his will that's what it could look like but in this moment one word accompanied with the great power and authority of who he truly was God in the flesh was enough to send this whole group falling backwards uh, when he made that declaration of who he is and as they're picking themselves up off the ground, verse 7, he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I've told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let, me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled of those you gave me, I have lost none. In other words, listen, okay, let them go. For again, the heart of the shepherd wanting to keep them and protect them even right to the end. He asked the second time, so le take me, but leave them. Now, verse 10, then Simon Peter having a sword. And the first question that springs to mind is, who gave this man a sword? Peter, this impulsive character that we've grown to love, because there's obviously a lot of identification that we have with him uh, in many ways. He always seems to almost write on cue, say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing at the at the wrong time. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And John gives us his name, Malchus. All the Gospels mention this, so only John mentions his name, also identifying Peter. And we are, there's an irony with Peter, isn't there? Such an impulsive, almost unpredictable character. Here he's ready to draw the sword in the face of this mass of armed men and then a little bit later at the accusation of a girl he's going to deny the Lord. Very impulsive, very emotional, but right here Peter doesn't wait. He lashes out and um, either Malchus ducked or Peter's just a terrible swordsman, but nevertheless he cuts off the ear. And Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in the, in the sheath. Shall Here it is. Shall I not drink the cup my Father has given me? And again, here is the resolve of Jesus. His face is set like a flint towards the cross. He is the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for the sheep. For this, for this hour he came. For the love of God and the love that was in his very heart 
would lead him all the way as a servant to lay down his life for us. And in that moment, according to Luke's gospel, Jesus answered, and it's interesting that Luke records this, because Luke, of course, the physician or the doctor is interested in, the he- in this healing, shows how Jesus says, please allow this, and he touched the ear and he healed him. And the servant's name was Malchus. Imagine being Malchus, the servant of the high priest. You would never forget this, as you would think those that were standing around. And then, we'll close here, then the detachment of troops... And the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away. So this is the arrest of our Lord. Now the hour was upon him. Now the cross was right before him. The reason that he came, that he did not, he, he endured the cross. He went there, and of course, as is framed and woven all through the epistles and all through the scriptures, it was love that was his motivation for us God so loved the world he gave his son the son expressing such love that he would lay down his life for us oh thank you Lord let's pray together oh father we thank you for the amazing love and resolve that is shown uh, in these verses as we think about uh, Jesus our savior who so willingly gave himself as a sacrifice for us oh we love you and we praise you this morning We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for such love that was expressed, even right from the washing of the feet of of his denier and his betrayer and all of the disciples that would would flee into the night at this this arrest. Oh, we thank you for the love, uh, how you served, how you came, how you gave. And in our hearts this day, we... We look to you and praise you and thank you for such a glorious gospel, such a wonderful Savior. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word together and study it. We pray for those perhaps this morning, there may be one or some that don't know Jesus as their Savior. Or if you're listening today, you're not sure of your salvation, whatever country you're from, whatever background you're from, Oh, God loves you. Jesus died for you. And in your heart, say, Jesus, I want to take this moment and trust you as my personal Savior. And thank you for saving me today by your grace in Jesus' name. And each one of us, bless us with truth in the innermost parts today, your spirit quickening us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.